today. But I've been thinking about this message series for quite some time now. We got started off the year. I hope, I hope you felt like we got started off right as we looked at Joshua chapter 1 last week. We talked about this whole concept of moving ahead, moving forward. Not letting anything stand in your way. You have God on your side. No enemy, no battle. Nothing ahead of you. Nothing present, nothing in the future can stand in your way. The destiny and the purpose that God has for you. And that's not just fluff talk. Like, this is actually what God said to Joshua. Be strong and courageous. All your enemies are going to fall. You're going to be successful in the mission that I've given you. And that's the call for every single one of us. But, but today I want to challenge our hearts with this word today as we talk about what it means to blaze this trail as Welcome Wesleyan Church in 2019. And we're going to be talking for the next six weeks about this. And uh, it's funny, I, uh, I, I usually don't hear other preacher sermons and say, man, i got to go preach that sermon. Uh, but interestingly enough, a few months ago, I heard a sermon by Brendan Manning and I knew I had to bring it to welcome. I'm not typically into that whole share your sermon thing. And I know some pastors are more like steal your sermon. But, you know, it's, 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 it's one of those deals where you hear something and you know God is stirring your heart to give it to the church. It's okay, I think, as long as you give people credit. But then as the more I listened to the message, I realized that it was so dense and it was so powerful. It has so much substance to it that what we actually needed to do is we needed to take a whole series and break this thing down. So for six weeks, we're going to be in this series called Unsettled, Being Pioneers in 2019. Uh, so, so I want to talk to you about living an unsettled life. In, 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 in my perspective and what I'm looking at here and seeing from the Word of God, I, I think there are two types of people who call themselves Christians. Two types of people. There are pioneers and there are settlers. And, and throughout this series, I'm going to be asking you to consider which one you think you are. And, and try to consider which one truly and more accurately bears the name Christian. That is, that literally means little Christ or one who follows after the footsteps of Christ. Which one are you? A settler? Or are you a pioneer? Each have their own theology. Each have their own ideas about what it means to follow Jesus. And so as you can imagine here, the, the setting for this series is the Wild West. Okay? And how many of you like Westerns? How many of you grew up watching Westerns? Anybody like Bonanza and all that good stuff? I'm, I'm glad. To, hey, look around here. I'm glad to see look at all these college students that like Bonanza and like these Westerns. All right? Uh, probably what really got me motivated to do this was the fact that I was watching, have been watching for some time, because it's hours and hours and hours of it, but it's this Ken Burns documentary series called The West. He made it back in 1996. It's, it's a fascinating documentary series, and it's all about going back in time before the West was set. It was, it was when it was still this vast, unforgiving wilderness that people were just pioneering, blazing a trail through there. Now yeah, think about going back to those old times and Macy, she, uh, we went over to my folks' house over New Year's and she and my dad really enjoyed watching the Twilight Zone, okay? And, uh, and it was really cool because in one of the episodes that we were watching there, we were kind of doing this Twilight Zone marathon thing. One of the episodes is, is there's this guy, he's in like 1950s America. And you know that's when the Twilight Zone was made, you know, mid-50s, early 60s. And he's in 1950s America, and he is, he is just so upset and stressed out about the hustle and bustle of life in 1950s America, okay? And he is just like, oh, just the rat race of the 1950s. And he's like on a train going home, and he begins to dream about what life would be like in the western 1880s when everything was, was peaceful. And I'm just cracking up because I'm thinking like today, we would just like to go back to something a little more peaceful, sort of like the 1950s, right? But this dude is longing for the 1980s, or rather the 1880s. 1980s was great too. I mean, you know, Michael Jackson, me being born, all that stuff. Um, but at any rate, I'm thinking about this series. I'm thinking about what it means to look at a wilderness to be conquered, to look at a trail to blaze, to, to be a pioneer. 
And so today I'm going to give you an overview of each one of these word pictures. This is going to be highly illustrative. And everything's going to have a symbol to it. And I'm going to give you an overview of each of these word pictures today. And then in the, preceding, in the, in the following weeks, we're going to be breaking them down. So the, the theme scripture for this is Galatians 5.1. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Now I'm going to read that again. I'm going to ask if you will read that aloud with me. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So let me break down the pictures that I want to give you in comparing settler theology to pioneer theology. In settler theology, the church is the courthouse. This is a place where records are kept, taxes are collected, trials held for the bad guys. Because you see, settlers value safety and security in their little town above all else. So they want the security of the courthouse. They like looking to the courthouse. They like looking to all the safety and the law and the order that it provides. The, the courthouse is, is a symbol for them. It's not particularly vibrant or something that challenges them or it's necessarily a part of their day-to-day -day lives, but, but it's a symbol of safety and security and settlers like safety. They like order. How do pioneers view the church? In pioneer theology, the church is the covered wagon. Instead of being a place of safety and security within the confines of a little town, what is a covered wagon? It's a, it's a house on wheels. It's always on the move. The pioneers eat here. They sleep here. Now listen, it's not the most comfortable setup. In fact, sometimes it can be uncomfortable, the, the covered wagon. You know, it's, it's not like settling in a little town and building your little house with picket fences. No, the covered wagon, it's, it's got those hard boards in the back and, and you're tossing and you're, you're turning. But, but here's the thing about the pioneers. They love the covered wagon because that thing gets them where they need to go. That covered wagon is with them on a mission. It is moving. It is going forward. It is not stagnant. It is not stale. And the pioneers don't so much value safety and security as they value forging new paths. The covered wagon helps them do that. Now how do settlers view God? God is the mayor. The settlers fear him. He's quite distant. Nobody really knows the mayor very well. Nobody really gets acquainted with him on a, on a very personal level. He, he has an office, an office above the courthouse, and he sits there all day. Every now and then he'll look out over the town just to make sure that law and order are being maintained. But for the most part, he keeps the blinds drawn, and nobody really knows what's going on with the mayor up there. Other than the fact that those who have had encounters with the mayor will tell you that he's a very harsh man. That he has absolutely no patience or mercy for human sin and infirmity. He values law above everything. And he will crush and judge and pour out wrath on anybody who dares challenge the law. Although he's an entirely intimidating figure, you see the settlers are happy with the mayor. Because why? What do they value? Safety. Security, law, order, peace, quiet. As long as the mayor's up there in the office, they have this assurance that everything in their life is going to be fine and it's going to be secure. So they'll deal with him being the harsh guy that he is, being the distant, unknowable person that he is. Can get some pictures here, folks? In pioneer theology, God is the trail boss. 
He's with the pioneers. He is always challenging the pioneers to move forward. He's rough. He's rugged. If it wouldn't be too irreverent, I'd say he chews tobacco. I'll just say he chews tobacco, okay? The trail boss, he lives, he eats, he sleeps, he fights alongside the pioneers, he charts the way for the pioneers, he lives among the pioneers, and he never promises them safety, but he always promises he'll be with them. And they trust the trail boss because they know he's good and they know his heart is for them and they know where he's leading. They know the chart and the path that he is leading is for their good and it's leading them into their destiny. And so even though it's not necessarily safety and security that they're after, the trail boss provides them a purpose. We're going somewhere. We're blazing a trail that's never been blazed before. We're on a mission together. And He fills them with such a sense of destiny. He'll even get down in the mud and push the wagons out with them. <coughs> How do settlers view Jesus? Settlers see Jesus as a sheriff. He's got a real tall, shiny, white hat. He polishes his badge every few minutes to make sure it gleams and sparkles in the sunlight when he walks around. He's got a real clean, metallic six-shooter on his side. He's got chaps that have never been dirty. He walks along the town showing that six-shooter, walking around the edges, and he saves the settlers by making sure the town stays safe and secure. He would never ask them to go outside the town and go into the uncharted wilderness. No, no, that's not what the sheriff, Jesus, to the settlers does. He makes sure that they're comfortable all the time. He makes sure that they don't have anything to worry about. And there's even a saying in the town where he says, just put your trust in the sheriff and you'll always be safe and secure. No harm or discomfort will befall you. And if you just believe that the mayor sent the sheriff, you won't die in jail. In pioneer theology, Jesus is the scout. He lives all the dangers of the trip before any of the pioneers go that way. He never asks the pioneers to go into any rocky, dangerous territory that he himself has not already gone down. He is muddy. He is bloody. He has faced the dangers of the trail. He has been attacked by hostile forces and wild animals. And he always makes a way for the pioneers. They know how to be a good pioneer because of his example that he has laid out for them. He's trail and battle tested. He's wild. He's courageous. He is feared by the settlers, but he is beloved by the pioneers. He reveals the intentions and the heart of the trail boss. He shows them that the trail that has been marked out is the best trail for them. He reveals that they're being led down the best path. What about the Holy Spirit? Just go with me here, okay? In settler theology, the Holy Spirit is the saloon girl. The settlers come to her when they're lonely or when they're feeling bad about themselves. And settlers don't like feeling bad or lonely. Settlers like feeling secure, comfort. And so they come to her and she comforts the settlers. She tickles them under their chin and she says, everything's going to be just fine. Of course, 
What you know about this saloon girl is she's going to go squeal to the mayor and the sheriff every time you do something that you're not supposed to be doing. So the Holy Spirit in settler theology can turn from being just this comfort repository to being this complete and total guilt-laden guilt monger in a minute. Making you feel wrath and bad and judged. That's how she works in settler theology. In pioneer theology, the Holy Spirit is the buffalo hunter. He rides along the trail and he provides the meat for the pioneers. You see, his job is to empower them for life on the trail, to provide for their survival, to make sure that every pioneer has everything they need to sustain them, to empower them, and to feed their hunger as they are blazing this trail, following behind the trail boss and the scout. But here's the thing about the buffalo hunter. He is really unpredictable. It's hard for the pioneers to know what he's going to do next. The settlers absolutely cannot stand the buffalo hunter. Because you see, the settlers get together every Sunday at the courthouse for an ice cream party. And it's just this great party where everybody's rubbing elbows and bumping shoulders with each other and patting each other on the back for what great settlers they are. It's just an awesome time of socializing. It's a great social club. Everybody leaves feeling great. Then they forget about it until about Saturday night. And they're like, oh, we get to go back to the social club again, the courthouse, and have an ice cream party. And this is what the buffalo hunter just delights in doing when they do this. He comes through the town with his big black six shooter and he starts shooting up the town while they're having their ice cream social and the settlers don't know what to do with him. He scares the horses and the animals and the little kids and the moms and the dads and they're like, what? Why is he terrorizing us? Can he just go somewhere else? We want predictable here. We want safe around here. Buffalo Hunter just goes out laughing with glee, knowing that he made them uncomfortable with their little impotent gatherings. You see, the settlers fear the open and unknown frontier. They want to stay in good graces with the mayor. In fact, they would prefer to stay out of the mayor and the sheriff's way. As long as you're not hearing from the mayor, <laughs> hey, as long as you're not hearing from the sheriff, Things must be going pretty well. So this whole idea to a settler of having a, a relationship, an intimate knowledge of them, where you're living together, riding the trail together, this whole idea of having a relationship with God and Jesus, the mayor and the sheriff, that's, that's bizarre to them. Uh, faith isn't that personal. No, no, no. That they're happy with the fact that they're there, they provide the safety they want, but this idea of being close, that, that's just absurd. Of course the settler never misses an ice cream party. But they don't know the sheriff. They don't really know the mayor. The pioneer, on the other hand, longs for the daring adventure of the trail. They ride hard and they aren't afraid to use their weapons the trail bosses equip them with. They love the settlers. That they feel sorry for the settlers because they're stuck. And, and they try their best to explain to them what the joys of life on the trail is like. But the settlers just stay stuck. I know what y'all are wondering. Who's the pastor in all this, right? Where does he or she come in? Settler theology, the pastor is... The banker. See, to the settlers, he has all the resources of the town, and, and he thinks that they're safest with him. He'll manage the resources better than anybody else will, so he keeps them all in the bank, and in fact, the banker, the pastor, believes that he and Jesus have a lot in common. 
fact, you might even say that the, the baker has himself a little bit of a Messiah complex because after all, don't they protect the people? Don't they protect the, the resources of the people? And, and the people respect him for that and he likes that. He, he wants to be well received and well respected and, and, and he wants to be counted among the other important people. That's how the banker thinks. In pioneer theology, the pastor is the cook. He does not, nor does he claim to provide the meat. The meat comes from the buffalo. The Holy Spirit is the one who provides the power and the meat behind what the cook serves up. Now, he's been given a certain set of skills to be able to dress the meat up, to be able to serve it and present it to the pioneers in a way that not only do they know they need to eat it, but they enjoy eating it. They get some happiness out of it. But he never confuses his role with the role of the buffalo hunter. He never begins to think that he is the one providing for the people. No, in fact, the cook among the pioneers realizes he is very much just another pioneer. Someone that is in need of what the trail boss, the scout, and the buffalo hunter provide, just like everybody else, he needs the Holy Spirit just as desperately as all of the other pioneers on the trail. Sure. He's been given the skills that makes him a little bit popular, but he never stops realizing that he's just a pioneer. He wants his fellow pioneers to be as strong as they can be. He wants to dish up for them as much as resources will allow that the Holy Spirit has provided. In separate theology, faith is obeying the laws that provide safety. See, faith for a settler just means you keep your nose clean. Remember, the church is the courthouse. It's the symbol of safety and security. God is the distant mayor who provides safety and security with wrath and judgment. Jesus is the scout who saves you by keeping out anything that would endanger you. And, and so basically it's like this. They say, well, 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 God must be there because look at all the evidence around us of the safetyness. God must be there. And, and, and so I, as the settler, faith for me is just making sure that I stay inside the lines. But, but that's the extent of it. How many people do you know that view faith this way? That, that to them, the, the, the church is just no more than this good agent of society. Provides more restraint, provides safety. But, but listen, in pioneer theology... Faith is the spirit of adventure and the readiness to move out. Don't get me wrong. It's also about obedience. But it is an obedience to the restless voice of the trail walls. In separate theology, sin is breaking one of the town ordinances. But in pioneer theology, sin is wanting to turn back and to turn away from the trail walls. So folks, there's the illustration. What's really going on here? What do you think about these settlers? Clearly they're very religious people, right? I mean, they have an unshakable faith in the values and the ideals of the town. To, to speak in terms of right now, they're in church regularly. Right? Settlers come to church. But, but for the settler, faith is not a very adventure. It's become stagnant. It's not about intimacy. It's about safety. They can't claim to know Jesus personally and walk with Him every day, but they wouldn't dare give up what they think their faith provides them, security. They like the fact that their faith can provide their 
family values. They think that the church brings good restraint to their children, shows them what's right, but really what they believe in is not Christianity. I've heard it called moral therapeutic deism. Moral in the sense that it teaches you the, the good foundations to live a, a virtuous life. It's not bad. Therapeutic in the sense that when you come to church, it's like a therapy session. Hey man, I had a tough week. I can't wait to get picked back up. <clears throat> Deism. Meaning that God created. And then He stepped away and is no longer intimately involved in the details of human life. <clears throat> Living like a Christian on Sunday and like an atheist throughout the rest of the week as if God is not there, as if He does not exist, as if He does not care. But you come back on Sunday to get refilled again and recharge the batteries. Friends, if that's how you treat God and church and faith, then that, my friends, is living a settled life. That is a settler's life. That is a life of, I like the rhythm, I like the order, and I like the security, but don't you be talking about that stuff that it's going to cost me during the week. Amen. It quickly becomes about law and not about living the freedom for freedom Christ has set us free. Keep the traditions, we'll all be safer. Give me that old time religion. Come on, somebody. Give me that old time religion. But even though they have their nice, clean, safe reality, the truth is, settlers are enslaved. They form their own prison, and they're happy with it. They don't want anybody telling them they're in it. Like the Pharisees of the first century, they want as many people to remain in the enclosure because they're threatened by the outside. They wouldn't dare go outside to forge anything ahead or help others. As Matthew 23, 4 says, they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they lay them on the shoulders of others, but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. Did you get that? Here's how you know if you're living the settler life. When you think about the next generation and reaching this world with the gospel, where do you see yourself in? Is it just my job? When you think about the next generation that are going to be called followers of Christ, do you think the person next to you is going to be the one that's going to forge the path? You think about the hundreds and thousands of unbelievers in this community that you see and interact with every single day. Do you personally feel responsible for them? Do you personally feel that you are being called to blaze the trail? Now, I don't recommend that you go out and you stand on the street corner with a bullhorn and with a sign that says, Turn or Burn. I don't recommend that. <laughs> I don't think that's how you're going to win the next generation. I don't think that's effective. But I do believe you need to be sharing your faith with people. I do believe people need to know that you follow Jesus and you don't have to be a jerk about it in order to be effective. Don't let it be like those two guys that showed up at the church I went to when I was a little kid. And, uh, one guy had been going there a long time and then another dude showed up one Sunday just randomly visiting and they went up to the pastor afterward and they were like, can you believe this? I mean, they were all smiles. All smiles. Like, can you believe this, pastor? We've been working together for 30 years and neither one of us knew the other was a Christian. Wow. But let that be said, a welcome lesson in church. Pioneers are people who have discovered the freedom for which Christ has made us free, and they are ready to move. They are not afraid to live 
without safety and without security. They get that the mission of the church moving along the trail is about rescuing others, even those who are enclosed in their self-imposed prison. You see, in a church where people get what it means to be a pioneer, listen to me carefully, you are never pulling teeth to mobilize people on mission to go out and do something for this community. It's not like pulling teeth. Joan Crane doesn't have to call them 20 times to get them to come, all right? And I'm grateful she's willing to do that. In a church, what it means to be a pioneer, they are always mobilizing because this is what they live for. That is what faith is. It is the adventure of the trail. And they understand that the call of Jesus for each one of us is not come to the courthouse. The call of Jesus is not come to the church. What is the call of Jesus? Come to me. All you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me. When you find him to be who he is, you follow the path that he goes down. You can't be a follower of Christ and not follow the path that Christ led. And this is how Christ described that path. He said, take up your cross and follow me. Take up your instrument of death in which you die to yourself and you live a new life with me on the trail. You die to safety. You die to comfort. You die to security. And you're willing to take up life with me where it is a wilderness, where I can't guarantee your security, where I cannot tell you everything is going to be all right. But I will tell you this. I will be with you even until the end of the earth and all authority and power has been given to me to go with you. So follow me. I hope throughout this series that you will get unsettled. And I, I, I'm just going to tell you, if, if you decide that you, uh, this, is, this is tough stuff, I'm just going to get it for you. This is what's happening for the next six weeks. So if I don't see you, I know you're set. No, I'm just kidding. 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 I'm, <laughs> I'm going to ask you a question as the worship team makes their way back up here. You know, I think back to a couple weeks. You know what we did up here? We came up here and I asked you to come if you had a need that you needed ministry to. If you needed to be healed. Or if you were carrying a burden for someone. Just some kind of need to be ministered to. I asked you to come forward and, and you responded. And that's a good and right and appropriate thing. Don't get me wrong. On the trail, pioneers take care of one another. Uh, on, on the trail, if a pioneer is sick, the other pioneers will do what they have to do to try to make that pioneer get well. But, but the question is, why? Why do pioneers minister to each other's needs? It's because we need you on the trail with us. We're on a mission together. So when you come in here, we are here for you. We are here to minister to you. But we are not here just so that we can keep that ministry inside these four walls. Are you with me? Amen. We're here so that we can get strength, encouragement, the sustenance. The cook comes in and provides, dishes up what the Holy Spirit provides. And then we hit the trail again, following Jesus. You're not following Jesus sitting right here. You'll you'd be falling about those doors because that's where he's going after this is over. Yeah. That's what that means. So you came forward a couple weeks ago to have your needs ministered to. Last week we had a beautiful time of prayer around the altar. But here's what I'm asking you right now. Will you come forward to say, I am stepping out as a pioneer. I will not live the settled life. I believe that I have a role in this wagon train. I believe that when I go out these doors, I'm an ambassador for Jesus Christ. 
And every single person that I meet needs to hear and to experience His love through me. And this time next year, I'm declaring it, there's going to be people sitting in this room right now because I decided to be a pioneer. This time next year, people are going to be sitting beside of me because I chose to be a pioneer. I chose to blaze a trail and to go out in the strength that only God provides.